this railroad disaster in Denmark on one of Europe's most iconic bridges. This was a ticking time bomb. No one had any idea there was a problem until it was too late. A hidden design flaw with tragic consequences. One of the most fatal and tragic uh, accidents uh, in, in Danish train history. A deadly discovery that sent shockwaves across Europe. We warned the other investigation boards in Europe that this could be safety critical. Denmark. For centuries, the capital Copenhagen, on the nation's biggest island, could only be reached by boat. Stefan Jorgensen is a local journalist. Denmark is a small country separated by many islands. If you had to travel from the western part of Denmark to the capital of Copenhagen, you had to take ferries. It took hours. But then, in 1998, the Great Belt Bridge was constructed and everything changed. With a main span of just over one and a half kilometers, the Great Belt Fixed Link is the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Standing tall, this mammoth crossing revolutionized Denmark's transportation network. The Great Belt Bridge totally redefined the infrastructure of this country. So what took an hour before crossing by ferry uh, now takes not more than 10 minutes. This crucial link helped connect northern Scandinavia with the rest of Europe to the south by both road and rail. And sometimes a clever combination of both, known as piggybacking. For about 40 years, Europe has used rail network to carry road freight semi-trailers, piggybacking on specialist rail cars called pocket wagons. Instead of being towed by a truck, the trailer sits in the wagon like being in a pocket. The only fixed connection is where the trailer's kingpin slots into the rail car's saddle, with teeth that grip it in place, all secured by a locking arm. This tried and tested method was transporting freight safely across the Great Belt Bridge and into Europe for decades. January the 2nd, 2019, a 110 kilometer an hour storm was battering the coast of Denmark. The Great Belt Bridge was right in its firing line and closed to road traffic, but open to rail. Local journalist Stefan Jorgensen was on the train to work. I was crossing the Great Belt Bridge and um, approximately about uh, half past seven, uh, the train stopped in the middle of the bridge. And in, in the speakers, uh, they announced that we had to stop because a cargo train had to drop something, some kind of tarp on the tracks, and that we couldn't proceed. Chief accident investigator Bo Hanning was on duty at the time. We got a phone call from the Danish State Railways, the SB, who told us there has been some incident on the Great Belt. Maybe some passengers had got wounded a bit. It was far worse. At 7.29 a.m., a commuter train heading to Copenhagen collided with a semi-trailer hanging from a freight train. We pretty quickly found out that it wasn't just a tarp on the tracks. It was uh, a lot bigger than that. It was very serious. Moments before the incident, CCTV captured this grainy footage. The empty trailer had fallen sideways from the freight train and was being dragged into the path of the oncoming commuter train. Both were traveling at around 120 kilometers an hour. By the time the passenger train saw the trailer, it was too late. In a very few seconds, there was huge damages along both the passenger train and the freight train. 131 passengers were on board when the front carriage hit the trailer. 18 people were injured. Sadly, eight lost their lives. What started out for me and I guess many other journalists as a quite normal day quickly turned out to be an extraordinary day with one of the most fatal and tragic accidents in, in Danish train history. 
This accident was on one of Denmark's busiest bridges, between two regular rail services. So Bo knew they had to uncover the cause of the disaster. It was important for us to find out as fast as possible what happened. Not, not only what happened, but why. For me, I can describe this as a big puzzle, and we have to find all the parts to put together. The accident spread wreckage along hundreds of meters of track. The collision actually was just after the, where the bridge started, and then the passenger train uh, broke and, and stopped a few hundred meters uh, after. And the freight train continued here on the line and actually stopped around here with the uh, locomotive just over there uh, uh, and, and with, the, with the wagons up here. The semi-trailer had been dragged sideways by the pocket wagon until it was knocked completely clear by the passenger train. Bo and his team faced a massive challenge finding evidence. It was a train with empty beer bottles in boxes. So there was glass bottles all over. So we was trying to locate which parts on the, on the track was actually a part of the accident and was train part from the freight train or from the passenger train. The big question for Bo and his team was why the semi-trailer had fallen from the pocket wagon. So investigators focused on the only connection between trailer and rail car, the kingpin and saddle. We had three main scenarios. One of them was that the semi-trailer was correct loaded, but not locked. One of them was actually that it was wrong loaded. And the last scenario was that it was correct loaded, but the wind was strong enough to draw it out. Just six days after the crash, with the investigation still underway, the Danish authorities banned all pocket wagons from the rail network. Suddenly, uh, goods from going from Germany, for example, to Sweden couldn't cross in Denmark with these uh, kind of uh, wagons. These kind of pocket wagons were banned until the companies could uh, reassure the Danish authorities that uh, it was safe. To find out how the seven-ton semi-trailer had been blown from the pocket wagon, the team brought in Professors Jens Sorensen and Robert Mickelson, wind experts from the Technical University of Denmark. We used a model train, which is identical to the real train, uh, and put that into a wind tunnel to measure and test, visualize, and investigate how the, the wind was blown around the bridge and the train. By simulating the exact conditions on the bridge that morning, Jens and Robert discovered that strong winds, combined with the speed of the train, were enough to blow the empty trailer off the pocket wagon on one condition. We found out that a wind speed in the order of 22 meters per second was sufficient to crash this down here, provided that the king rod was not attached. The theory was tested at full scale with an empty trailer in equivalent winds, proving that if unlocked, the kingpin could be blown from the saddle. But according to reports, the kingpin had been properly locked in place. If it was locked correct and you lift in the semi-trailer, it is so heavy the lock that you could lift the wagon, the whole wagon, and you don't have wind powers enough to derail both the wagon and the semi-trailer in a train. On closer investigation, they discovered a previously unknown flaw in the pocket wagon system. The locking teeth on the saddle weren't always locking. The problem was really very simple. Although the operating lever looked to be locked, the teeth in the saddle weren't always fully closing around the kingpin, meaning it wasn't locked at all. And this floor was made worse by maintenance access issues. We could see that actually the maintenance of these locks was not done for several years. To be sure that the lock could work, you have to open and to lubricate the beneath of the lock to be sure all the parts inside could work, and it hasn't been done. While it's clear proper lubrication was safety critical, it wasn't mentioned in the guidelines. 
This is one of those problems that goes unnoticed until a disaster brings it into the light. Pocket wagons had been hurtling around Europe, unsecured for years. The combination of the trailer being empty and exposed to high winds on the bridge revealed the problem very dramatically. With the cause of the accident identified, new maintenance guidelines for locking mechanisms were implemented throughout Europe. So this was one of the consequences, to be sure that other hitches of this type wouldn't have uh, risked the same failure in the future. In the wake of this accident, the rules were changed, requiring these crucial connections to be serviced regularly. So hopefully nothing like this can ever happen again.